What is it that makes faith attractive in general and Christianity attractive specifically? Some people think it might be facilities or personalities, but the truth is there are some beautiful facilities that really don't attract anyone anymore. And there are some personalities that can kind of cut both ways. They can uh, distract as, as often as they attract. What is it that makes Christianity attractive? And the answer is that we have a God who actually serves. We're not prepared for that. There's nothing in our culture that sets us up for that. And so we're going to look at an example of that today in Scripture. It's John the the 13th chapter, and we're going to try something uh, today. What I'd like us to do is on all the odd verses, and we're starting with verse 1, so if I recall my evens and odds correctly, that would be an odd verse. On all odd verses, we're going to read those out loud and together, and then I'll do the even verses on my own. Everybody got that? No? Okay. Here we go. All out and together. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Some people believe you don't really need other people in life. In fact, our culture sometimes indicates that if you don't need anyone else, you might be a stronger person. It's not my experience. I've not yet met the person who thought life wasn't worth living who had too many deep relationships. Anyone who promotes isolation in our culture has an agenda that you won't like. It's not good for you. When we come together and we serve one another, it impacts our culture in a way that is as startling as the disciples were when Jesus served them. You see, our culture has a lot of assumptions about faith in particular and Christianity specifically. They have assumptions about religion. And they, they assume that basically what we do is we, we think we're better than other people and we look for reasons not to help. And when they come across a Christian who serves, it confuses them a little bit because a Christian can still hold to values while they serve. Our culture says you have to pick. 
But Jesus says you can do both. For the 12 that had, were with Jesus on this particular event, they had been spending over three years with him. They had listened to him speak. They listened to his messages and his conversations. They, they watched his interactions with people. And uh, on every rung of the social ladder, they, they saw how he spoke and interacted with people who were rich and powerful and those who were poor and powerless. And there was an unbelievable consistency on how he went about that. And, uh, but despite observing that for over three years, they had still been saturated in a culture, both political and religious, that created a default in them. And what I want you to know is that we're not exempt from that ourselves. Our own culture operates on the same principles. It is one thing to see what Jesus does. It is quite another thing to respond like Jesus responds. That verse in, in verse 15, he says, I've set you an example that you should do as I've done. See, there are some things that Jesus did we don't like to do. There's a precious little boy right now who needs a miracle, and I wish I could heal like Jesus. We want to heal. We, we want to calm storms. We want to turn water into wine. But selective reading and selective hearing will hide other actions of Jesus, like the ones we just read. And Jesus knew something that the 12 didn't know. He knew he's about to be betrayed. He knew he's about to be falsely accused. He knew, he knew that there's going to be a trial that has already been, the verdict has already been established before it ever starts. And, and he knew he's not going to physically survive this event, that, that there's going to be death. And still, he takes time to wash their feet. And, and in case you don't know, Washing feet in those days was considered the worst job you could get, which is why it always went to the lowest person in any house. If you were washing feet, it meant there was nobody lower than you on the status ladder. And so it was just kind of a painful reminder. And why did they need to wash Feet. Well, because roads back then were not so much concrete and asphalt like we have today. They're, at best, they were stones that were kind of connected together, and they were shared with every kind of animal you can possibly imagine. There's a reason they put horses at the end of parades. <laughs> and, uh, and so all of those animals, carrying all of the things that they carry, including people, they would just... They would muck up the roadways, and the best you could hope for is a really dry day, and it wasn't always that. And when, when you walked into a house after walking on those roads, you couldn't really hide the odor that would come from your feet. The sandals that you wore probably protected you from sharp stones, but not from anything else. And so when you came into a house, the protocol was you washed feet. It's really hard to eat good food when you smell stuff like that. And so Jesus does this. And he teaches us something. He teaches us that if you're going to serve well, you need to love others. Verse 1, he says, Jesus loved them until the end. How did he love them? How did he, how did he show that? He served them. If, to quote uh, St. Jason Mraz, Love ain't a thing. Love is a verb. It's something you do. There's never been a community quite like the community of Jesus. It's because love isn't just a feeling that you have. It's a commitment that you make for the betterment of others. The, the second thing, if you want to serve well, is that you have to trust your future to God. It says in verse 3 that Jesus knew that the Father had all things, been put all things in his power and that he knew where he had come from and he knew he, where he was going. He knew he came from the Father. He knew he was returning to the Father. There's a kind of freedom that comes from knowing where you come from and knowing where you're going. Um, our culture doesn't operate with all that much freedom when it comes to that. A lot of our interactions are about trying to elevate our status. I want to be in the right circles. I want to network with the right people. I'm happy to help. 
but I'd like it to be a way to take some steps forward in life. And that really isn't about serving others, that's about serving ourselves. And there's a kind of bondage that comes to that because there's all kinds of things you never get to do if you only serve yourself. And there's all kinds of things you always feel like you have to do if you're serving yourself. Jesus had this capacity to understand that the opinions of others were not going to determine his destiny. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going to. It would have been very easy for Jesus to assign someone else the responsibility of foot washing that day. And knowing that Judas was going to betray him, that's who I would have tagged. And said, this is going to be the last meal he has with us. Let's let him get his hands dirty a little bit. But Jesus doesn't assign the task to somebody else, and he doesn't criticize people for the state of their feet. I mean, can you imagine by the time he gets to some of those disciples, he might have looked up at them and said, do you ever look where you're going? I mean, dear Lord, how do you find every single cow plot between here and Bethany? It's amazing. It's amazing how much freedom you find when you aren't trying to control other people's opinions or you're not trying to find fault. It's astonishing. I don't know anything that neutralizes a person's capacity to serve more than trying to figure out who's responsible for the situation as it is now. If, if you can't serve until you figure that out, you're handcuffed. Like you're done. There's another thing, too. If we don't realize our need to be cleansed ourselves, it's really hard to put much heart into participating in others getting cleansed. Uh, if you want to serve well, assume that there are things you will understand later. There's lots of things we don't understand now. Uh, Jesus told them that in verse 7. What's happening now you don't understand. You will understand it later. Peter and the rest of the 12 didn't understand what was happening right then. And honestly, Peter was offended. He, this inverted everything he thought about status and power and, and organized structure. And Peter was embarrassed. Listen to this. He was embarrassed that Jesus was going to wash his feet. And it's not because his feet was dirty. It's because his leader, the person he followed, was taking the lowest position. What does it say about you if you are the follower of the person who takes the lowest position? There's a little bit of pride rising up. Pride will neutralize our capacity to serve. Pride will keep us from allowing other people to serve us, and pride will keep us from serving others. And so there's things that we don't understand right now. Opportunities. I might not know all that God is doing. I might not know how the situation is going to turn out. But I do know there's something I can do right now. If you want to serve well, don't assume that you have to be willing to do everything before you do anything. Don't assume that you have to be willing to do everything before you do anything. It's absolutely amazing how often when we start seeing all that needs to be done, it disheartens us. We take a step back. I can't, I don't have that. When you see the need and how great it is, and then you see your own abilities or resources and how, how few they are. Our tendency is to disengage. This, story, this part of the story starts out with Peter saying, you, you can't wash my feet. And, and Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you have no part of me. There's no connection. That, I think I could take the rest of the morning just talking on that statement. There's no real connection. And, and Peter is a person of extremes. Well, then just wash everything. <laughs> just my hands, my head. Hmm. See, he goes to this kind of assumption that then you need to do more. And that this happens in our world too. That when you help, there are people who want you to do more. And so he says, then just wash more of me. And first he goes from offense to wanting more. I think that it helps us to realize we are limited. We're limited in the time that we have, the resources we have, the energy we have, the knowledge that we have. And to accept those limits is humbling, but that's a good thing. 
And to recognize, I, I can't fix everything, but I can do something. That's a really important thing. So it's amazing how often we feel pulled into a situation uh, and we just want to back away because we see all the need. Uh, something happened in that community of Jesus that day. Something holy broke in. And it came in through a towel and a bowl. I think for the rest of their lives, every time they were in a room and they would hear someone pouring water into a basin, they would have a spiritual flashback and their eyes would fill with tears and they would remember this moment. Every time they saw someone kneeling down to serve someone else, they, they would have a vivid memory. Here's the beautiful thing about serving is you don't really have to be an extrovert to serve. Most of us are not extroverts. And so we just assume, well, I can't really be part of community or be responsible for community because I'm, I'm not really good at just starting from nothing and, and, and talking. And what Jesus says is the way community gets established is not by being extroverted, but by serving. If you see a need, you're willing to help. When you do that, a connection gets made. Community starts right there. And, and these don't have to be big things, you know. Like someone coming down the aisle and you notice you've got a, a seat towards the inside and, and you could slide over and open up. That's a great way to serve. You just kind of slide over and you welcome in. It's amazing. You, you didn't have to, to say anything other than maybe just a gesture to let them know the seat's available. I, I was here last Sunday for you, Sunday. By the way, how many enjoyed last Sunday? Was that phenomenal? Just amazing. Yeah. So I walked in in this entire row where I usually sat, was all filled up, so okay, I can't sit, so, so I went over there and, and, and I sat, and then, and then people were coming in and they needed a place to sit, and, then, and so I, I moved over to this section over here, and, and then I was sitting there, and then a, a family came in through the doorway, and, and they needed that seat, so I, I, I got up and I moved back. I was standing back there by the, 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 the live stream cameras. That's where I spent part of my morning, and I didn't have to actually greet anybody or or say anything about that. Just let them know, oh, you can sit here. Or you can sit next to me. Um, you see somebody wandering around with an empty cup that they want to discard and they haven't figured out where the, the trash receptacles are. And say, oh, here, let me take that for you. Or, or giving up a preferred parking spot to someone else. In case you don't know, preferred seating in churches goes like this. Preferred seating is closer parking and further seating. <laughs> Get close to the building, sit in the back. That's just kind of, if you're in the back today, like you're VIPs, that's how it works. <laughs> and, and giving that up or opening a door or smiling, just a simple smile. You'd be surprised how well that can serve someone. Or if you see someone that they look a little lost in the facility, they just saying, can I, can I help you find something? You don't have to know anything about anyone to serve them, and you don't have to have anything in common with them to serve them. Our culture uh, has a thing now called influencers, and influencers are people who have a lot of followers. It's a social media thing, and, and they'll go to a restaurant or they'll use a product, and the goal is to use their influence to get people to go places and purchase things. And, and Jesus doesn't call us to build a platform, he just calls us to pick up a towel and a bowl. And when we do that, community happens. Jesus calls us to pour out, not store up. He said Jesus loved them to the end. He wasn't gathering followers to increase his status. He loved them, he encouraged them, he forgave them, and he served them to the end. Jesus sees value in every single person, and he sees the value of every single serve. That's how he makes a difference. So two quick things, and I'll let you go for the day that you've lost an hour's sleep on. First is secret serving actually promotes humility. There's something to be said for doing something without anyone knowing that you did it. You know, let's suppose that it snows here again in Rochester. I'm not saying that it will and praying that it doesn't, but let's suppose that it does, and let's suppose that you walk out of here on Sunday and there's a car next to yours and you're scraping out your windshield and, and you just kind of reach and scrape out their windshield and, and you don't leave an, a note on them. This windshield was scraped by Pastor Bob. They just, you don't do that. You just, they come out and, and they're surprised. Wow, 
some kind of miracle occurred. My, the snow didn't fall on my windshield. <laughs> There's something healthy, like doing something without getting credit for it or, or recognition that, that can build something in us, a healthy muscle of humility. But visible serving promotes community. The, that some of our serving needs to be hidden, but some of it needs to be seen. Because it's what helps to create a connection. I don't know anybody who wants to waste their time, their money, or their life. But I do know lots of people who do exactly that through self-serving. But I've never met the person who is a serving person who felt like they wasted anything. So, there is a risk in the serving model. And the basic risk is, is that we feel like we lose control of our life. We have no voice, we have no choice. And what I want to tell you is that's not the biblical model of serving. No choice and no voice is actually an indication that the relationship is not healthy and, and something needs to be done to intervene. Serving is not about losing your identity. Serving is about serving, acting out of the identity you've discovered in Christ. It's quite a different thing. So I know in our world, there's a lot of... Um, so here's the opinion that I hear often. Well, I, I really don't need to be part of a church to be spiritual. And uh, what I would say is, you don't need to be part of a church to go to heaven. Our relationship with God has been established by what he has done for us, not what we do for him. But I do struggle with concepts of spirituality that are limited to a feeling that I have or information that I can remember. Spirituality really occurs when we gather and we serve one another. And community gets established. I really can't find anywhere in scripture where spirituality or community is done in isolation. It's, it's much more than that. So there's some folks that are uh, passing a, a, a card out. And, and what I just want you to know is this isn't a trick to get people to sign up for stuff. But it, it just could be that while you were listening today, it occurred to you that your heart is inclined to want to do something you just don't know what to do. And so all this is is to provide some information to help you sort that out. And if you want to fill that out and turn that in, we'll do what we can to help you make that connection. Now, I do feel somewhat at risk because this could feel like, oh, this is just a way to recruit people to get stuff done. And I hope you know me well enough to know that that's not my heart. But I also hope you know, you, you know me well enough to know that I think community is really valuable. I think that there are lots of people who can sit in a room that is full and feel horribly alone. It's a very specific and acute kind of pain to be surrounded by people and feel alone. And so I think we're called to more than just showing up. I think our heart craves a connection. And I don't think that connection is reserved to the people who are really good at starting conversations without any assistance. I think community gets built the way Jesus shows us. We see a need. And we serve. We see something. And we respond. And Jesus said, you'll be blessed if you do this. So let's bow our heads. It's possible that you're here today and that's, that I just touched on something that went straight to your heart. It almost took your breath away. Surrounded by people, feeling alone. It's a really rough way to live. And there will not be a shortage of voices in your life that will basically tell you that the way out of that is just to think better of yourself. Say better things to yourself when you look in the mirror. 
And I wish that worked. But it doesn't. Because the world is filled with people that you don't see when you look in the mirror. I want you to know that you are not alone. There's a God who loves you so much he's willing to serve. And you're surrounded by people who love you so much we're willing to serve. And my guess is, is that you have something to offer too. And out of this serving comes a community that's life-giving. So Father, help us lean into the example your son gave. Not just to be inspired by it, but to actually try it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.